And now, a show with inappropriate language, The Power Movement. Welcome to The Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, it's back to a business episode. When I started this show, my goal was to put out an athlete interview one week and follow that up with a business show within the same sport the following week. That really doesn't happen anymore, and no one seems to mind. But the business episodes are important, and this week may be the most important business episode of all so far. It's Colleen Quigley, the marketing director for DeKine. And the main difference between Colleen and the rest of my business episodes is that Colleen happens to be a woman, a badass woman, and every other business episode and 90% of the action sports workforce is made up of men. Now, if you are a regular listener, you may be thinking, dude, whenever he brings a woman on, he talks about gender in the workplace or on the mountain or just gender in general. And that is not totally true. I think I've done one or two episodes with women where I didn't talk about it. But I really need to bring this up. And it's not like I sit at home and think to myself, I need to be a champion for women's causes with my podcast. But women are constantly getting fucked in the workplace. And while that's funny for me to say for obvious reasons, it's also really sad that it's so hard for a woman to get her due in society today. But here's the good news. Colleen Quigley has gotten her due. And when we did the podcast, she was a measly digital marketing manager. And in the months since we talked... She was promoted, she's now running the snow show at DeKine as the marketing director, and that is pretty awesome. Now that I've prepped you for women's discussions, you actually aren't going to get much about gender on this podcast. Just a couple of minutes. Colleen and I talk about coming up in the eastern border world, moving west, her pro snowboard career, and her behind-the-scenes desk jockey life. But before I get into the podcast, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram, at the Powell Movement, tell your friends about the show, and support my great sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, Spy Optic, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and brand new this week, another Seattle iconic brand, Stanley. Now, let's talk with Colleen Quigley. How are you doing? Super good. Monday morning. It's beautiful here. With the podcast, you are the first female I've had on that I'll call a business episode where you do have a long snowboard career, but really, we're going to talk about your work career as well. It's a shame that I haven't had more women on who have had important positions in the industry. I've had a few on my radar, but haven't been able to make it happen. But you're with DeKine, and I think first, before we get into anything, DeKine, I won't say it's a brand in transition, but it's a brand that's changed ownership a bunch over the past 10 years. Looking at the history, it was founded in Hawaii, it moved to Hood River, it was bought by Billabong in 2009, then bought by Altamont Capital in 2013, and just recently you were bought by the Marquee Group in December, and they own Bruno Magli and Body Glove, so kind of in the same wheelhouse of the kind, at least the Body Glove part of it. And when something like that happens at a core lifestyle brand, what is the feeling internally? Yeah, well... It's change, you know, and I think change can be great opportunities sometimes. And I think just a quick bit on the history of Dekine. I had personally been using their backpack since I think I was 10 or 11 years old. And I didn't know the history of the brand until I worked here, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, but it's super cool. The guy who founded the company, his name is Rob Kaplan, and he lived on Maui. And those guys are just like surfing and trying to figure out how to surf Jaws. and He just started essentially building leeches so that people could surf those waves and not lose their boards to the rocks. And that was the first product. And then he was obviously like a windsurfer and kiteboarder as well, living on Maui and eventually moved the company up here to Hood River because Hood River is one of the windsurf capitals of the world along with Maui. And then from that, with Hood directly in the office's backyard, at that point, they started making snow products. And I think it was not necessarily by design, which is pretty cool. Tom Burt essentially like came through the office and he was on his way to Alaska for a heli trip and he needed a backpack that he could get in a heli with. And currently what Dekine was making or what was on the market wasn't really cutting it for exactly what he needed for that purpose. And so the guys here actually in the office built like the first prototype of what is the heli pack. Is that like the heli pro? 
yeah, so it's like a franchise now of like a bunch of different packs, but that was actually the first pack that I had when I was like 10 or 11. It was a heli pack. From there, people just started asking for the heli pack. They saw Tom with it. People wanted it. And all of a sudden, the kind was kind of like, well, I guess we're in snowboarding. It kind of like snowballed from there. Mountain biking happened similarly. People were coming in with the snow packs and wanting modifications done, like add hydration or whatever. And all of a sudden, Dekine was like, okay, I guess we're in mountain biking now. And Post Canyon is right here in Hood River as well. So yeah, pretty cool. But with that, and Dekine's kind of really remarkable success, I think, by entering markets like that. And I don't want to understate how Dekine came to be because there are tons of talented people over the years doing lots of really smart stuff to make the business a success. But yeah, with that success, I think comes outside interest and investment. And eventually Rob Kaplan sold the company. Is he rich now? I would assume so. He comes through every now and then. He comes to our sales meetings and he just seems like a really humble, nice guy. I mean, I haven't spoken to him too many times, but he just seems like a nice dude who is generally just doing what he loves. But yeah, so he sold the company to Billabong and that was kind of before my time, but heard definitely was a bit challenging for sure. Billabong owned a few companies and they themselves were enormous. And then Billabong sold a company to Altamont. And that was kind of when I came on board with the company. A lot of changes. I think for the most part, Dekine was able and has been able to be kind of autonomous through all of that in Hood River, kind of just like doing its thing always steering the course and kind of staying true to its roots. And more or less, most companies seem to be owned by other companies in our space. It's rare to have like a situation like Patagonia. It's super cool. But for the most part, we're just kind of in the office doing our jobs. And the office is full of a bunch of surfers, snowboarders, mountain bikers, skiers. Yeah, we just kind of do our thing. You're doing your thing and you're under the Altamont umbrella and everything's cruising along and you get bought. I've been in the situation before where I've been with a company that gets bought and there's either excitement where new management's coming in and you guys really need it or there's uncertainty just because you don't know. I mean, it's like, hey, these new guys are going to come in. Are they going to change everything? Are they going to keep us the same? How are things going to work? And where are you guys in that mix right now? Well, it's definitely a mix of both for sure. And the only thing that you know for sure is that things are going to change. So... For me personally, and I can't totally speak for the whole building, but I think for me personally, I was excited. I think it's always kind of exciting when new people with new ideas and new perspectives come in. One thing that we talk about often here at Takayan is the brand is so real, like from where it's been and the potential of where it can go. And then the people who work here, everyone is so awesome and so dedicated and really actually participate and live and breathe the sports that we market to and you know we kind of laugh about it sometimes because it sounds maybe kind of silly but we are the consumers that we're trying to market and sell to no it makes sense and so you know it's always kind of exciting when new people come in with new ideas where you can tap to kinds potential i think everybody looks at this brand and they're like oh there's so much we can do here that we're not currently doing and it's also kind of scary because Where we've been is a very comfortable place where, like I said, we kind of are the consumers, the participants, so we know what that looks like. And it's a little scary to think about what's outside of there. You know, it's exciting and scary. When I was reading about the acquisition, there was a licensing agreement for JR286. What does that even mean? Because that is associated with the kind, and it sounds like you guys are all lumped together, but I don't know what that means because that's a weird name for a company to be associated (laughs) with you. It is, totally. And they're super cool. They're based out of California. They essentially build products. So basically, it's a partnership. Two companies partner together to own and operate Dekine. And Marquee, their real expertise is in brand management. And the JR286 company, their real expertise is in building product. And so the two companies kind of came together, each with what they're really, really good at. and The goal is that collectively, the two parts are equal three. Okay, so they're the manufacturing arm of the thing. You guys are are sales and marketing, and then 
you have a parent company in Marquee? Yeah, totally. It's kind of like having two parent companies in a certain way, but with different responsibilities. You know, one side is they're real experts in supply chain management and building products. And then on the other side, you've got real expertise in brand management and marketing. Yeah, so it's different. It's different from the way it's been in the past, but it's kind of exciting as well. Well, that's a nice little intro onto what the kind has been up to lately and the changes there. But we are going to get into your life and times and figure out how you got to the kind. And I have that you're from Groton, Massachusetts. But then I also read somewhere that you might have been born in New York. I was, yeah. So I was born in a town, Larchmont, New York. We kind of moved around a little bit as my dad's job changed over the years. And ultimately, I could probably claim a couple of different places as where I'm from. But I spent most of the years that really shaped who I am today and what I do today in Groton, Massachusetts. Do you have any mass hole to you? Totally. Yeah. And people often say that they think it's weird. I don't have the accent. I think it comes out when I've had a couple drinks, but somehow escaped out of there without an accent from New York or Massachusetts. I think I was a bit young in New York. And are you a fan of all the New England sports teams that win everything? I mean, I wouldn't say I'm not a fan, but it's not really in my peripheral even, which sounds weird, but I didn't really watch any football or baseball or anything like that. And it was kind of a trip when we first moved to Massachusetts. I was a freshman in high school and I remember showing up to school and everyone, like guys and girls, it was like paint on their faces. And I don't even know, like Red Sox colors are red and maybe blue. They'd have like ribbons in their hair and all this stuff. And I was kind of like, what is going on? They'd be like, oh, it's game day. You know, it just wasn't something that I was super aware of. I pretty much spent all of my time either doing sports or yeah, snowboarding or skateboarding. I was kind of getting into skateboarding at that time. Well, you have two brothers, right? Yeah, two older brothers, uh, Brian and Mike. And were you pretty much one of the crew? I mean, did you do everything with your brothers and get into skating and snowboarding with them? That was how I originally first got a snowboard. My oldest brother, I think he was kind of the instigator. He wanted one. And so I kind of vaguely remember I was nine. We went to, I don't remember like what store it was, but we were on our way to a basketball game and I was in my basketball outfit and my brothers were getting snowboards and the salesperson was like, oh, is she getting one? And my dad was kind of like, oh, do you want one? I was like, uh, Yeah. And so I kind of got my first snowboard almost by accident because my older brothers were doing it. And then, yeah, just eventually over the years, I think I mostly snowboarded in our backyard for the first couple of years. But over the years, they kind of just fell off and stopped doing it. And I just kept doing it. So you're really tall and you play a lot of sports. And when you say you're really tall, how tall are you? I'm 5'10". I think you appear to be taller than you almost are because in thinking of you, I was going to say you were 6'2". But you're 5'10", <laughs> which you're only an inch taller than me, but I think you just appear to be taller. Maybe it's like the hair. I have a ton of hair. It could be. You have bright red hair. It's red also. Yeah, that doesn't help. Did you hear a lot about being a ginger when you were younger? Yeah, so much. I mean, still to this day, it's like almost a daily occurrence. It's some sort of a joke. But I think when you're a kid, you're just less comfortable in your own skin or hair. And having red hair is less common, obviously, than any other hair type. So then when you're a kid, you're just kind of like, I'm weird. When you're an adult, it's kind of funny. People are saying it as a joke. But when you're a kid, I think it would sting a little bit more. Yeah, totally. And now I can participate in the joke where when I was a kid, I maybe just kind of didn't get it or was self-conscious or whatever. Were you snowboarding a shit ton once you got out of your backyard? I think Waterville Valley was your mountain. But did you go a lot? Yeah, I started working at this shop. A lot of people know it, especially if you're from the East Coast, called Eastern Border. And pretty much the same distance it took to get to Eastern Border to go to work, kind of in like the opposite direction. I could go ride this tiny little hill called Neshoba Valley. I mean, you could almost like throw a ball to the top of it, but you could go there and... Wayne Wong loves that place. It's amazing. It's pretty rad. You can go and ride for like an hour and a half and get 400 laps in and then... You know, I wasn't drinking when I was that age, but like now you could go there and like there's a bar there and you can just have a beer after you snowboard for an hour and a half and you don't have to invest the whole day or night or whatever. And they have night riding, which is super fun. So yeah, my parents used to drive me there before I got my driver's license and just go ride with friends. And then 
I was pitching rides up to Waterville. Back then, Waterville was super cool, and it still is, but Loon is kind of like the go-to in New Hampshire now. But back then, Pat Moore's mom, Deb Moore, kind of ran all the marketing at Waterville. And then this guy, Mike Batera, who builds a lot of parks these days, was running the park. And it was so fun. Like, everyone was there. The park was sick. It was just, like, super good time. So then I got my driver's license, and, yeah, I was just driving up there every day I could. And are you just a shop rat at Eastern Border? Totally. I mean, it was crazy. You worked there as a kid. I think I was making like minimum wage or something. And every dollar you make, you end up spending on skateboards or whatever else comes into the store. And then on my days off, like a lot of times I would just go there and hang out. Yeah, just there so much. And those guys are so awesome. Are you pretty much a tomboy growing up? For sure. Yeah. Completely. Like we just played a lot of sports in my family and it was competitive on the level of like we're competing with each other. It wasn't really like anybody trying to achieve some amazing level of athletic ability, although there's lots of really athletic people in my family. It was more just kind of like family getting together and getting kind of funny, competitive with each other. And I was definitely a tomboy. I think the first time that I ever put on a dress and the words came out of my mouth that I was like, oh, I love this dress. Like I never in my life would say anything like that. (laughs) I got married in August at our wedding. So that was probably a good first dress to like. Wow. That means you were a total tomboy growing up. And (laughs) in a situation like that, where you're a tomboy working at a shop that's I'm sure dominated by men, the world that you're in, are you looked at as an equal part of the crew? Yeah, I always felt that way. Yeah, it was all guys there. At the time that I worked there, and, you know, there's been lots of girls that have worked there over the years, but there was one other girl that worked at a different store. So there were five stores at that time. And she was a skateboarder, and we became friends, but we were working at different stores. So the store that I was in, yeah, it was all guys. And when I first started working there, I was the youngest, and I just felt like they were taking me under their wing and teaching me things in a lot of ways, you know, like through giving me shit about things I was saying or people I was hanging out with or things I was doing, you know, but all kind of in a way to show me and teach me kind of, which I really appreciate today. So you're 18 and it's time to start thinking about colleges. And I think UVM is your choice. Is there any reason other than staying in New England and being with the crew that you know? Yeah, totally. I'm like a bit embarrassed to admit the reason, but it was honestly because they didn't care that I was going to take off winter semesters and go travel and snowboard. Some of the other schools I was looking at, they were kind of like, well, that's not really going to work. You need to be here all the time. And when I had graduated high school, I deferred to UVM for a year. And I basically just like packed up my car and drove west to Mammoth for a year. I didn't really have a plan. But in that year, that was when I started making a little money snowboarding. And it kind of changed my world a little bit. And when I went back to the East Coast for school, I was kind of like, oh, I don't want to be in Vermont during the winter. So I did fall and summer semesters. And UVM was cool with it. They were kind of just like, yeah, whatever, we don't care. And some of the other schools I was looking at were a little more like, wait, what? You want to go miss a whole semester? Why? For snowboarding? No, that's not a that's not a thing. When you move out to Southern California, I mean, things in snowboarding, like you said, you made a little money. It happened really fast for you, though. Like, you went out after high school. And what's the progression? I mean, do you link up with someone and create a circle of friends out there? Honestly, I look back on it, and it seems so crazy. I was so naive. I didn't understand anything about anything, really. I was totally aware of pros. I mean, my walls were plastered with, like, posters, and I had tons of videos, and I was aware that that was a thing. You were a shop kid. You should have known all of that stuff, I would think. I was fully aware of it, but like, I guess I never really thought of it as a reality for me, maybe. Okay. And so when I packed up and moved out to Mammoth, I had this Toyota Tercel, like a little two-door car, and it was basically like a golf cart with like tinfoil wrapped around it, it felt like, and I drove across the country. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know anyone out there. And Shane Flood had been like pretty well-known pro at that time. And he's from New England. And I knew him from riding at Waterville. He was living in Mammoth and he was the only person I knew. And so I was talking to him when I was 
getting close to graduating high school. And he was like, you should just come out to Mammoth. That was kind of like the heyday of Grenade and seemed like everything that was going on, at least what I was paying attention to was happening in Mammoth. Yeah. And so it wasn't even a question. I didn't think of any other place. I wasn't like, oh, Mount Baker, Whistler, Salt Lake. I was just like, Mammoth is the only thing that exists. And so just talking to Shane, he kind of hooked me up with a couple of girls that he knew there that were looking for a roommate. And I didn't know them at all. And I basically just like packed up my car, drove across the country, literally arrived in Mammoth and just called him and was like, hey, I'm here. Should we meet each other? And that was it. All right. Well, I'm going to take a really quick break to talk about my sponsors. And I'm psyched to have a new sponsor on the show that makes products that I already use. I'm talking about Stanley. And if you listen to my podcast, you most likely like hot coffee and cold beer. And nothing keeps your coffee hotter and your beer colder than a Stanley. That's a bold statement, but it's true. Remember that green steel bottle that your grandpa brought to the mountain? The one that kept his coffee hot all day long? Well, that's a Stanley. And since 1913, Stanley has been fueling outdoor adventures from work to camp and beyond. And in celebration of Stanley's first Powell movement, we are giving 20% off Stanley products site-wide. To get the deal, head on over to stanley-pmi.com, pick out some stuff. My favorite product at the moment is the 1.4 quart master vacuum bottle that keeps my coffee hot for 40 hours and my beer cold for 35. Head over to checkout. Enter the code STANLEY20, that's all one word with a capital S, and the number 20, and you will get your 20% off. My next sponsor is Evo, and they have supported the podcast since day one. If you're a fan of the show, I hope you buy your skis, snowboard, bikes, outerwear, everything from Evo. They're the best retail experience in Denver, Seattle, Portland, and Whistler, and their website, evo.com, features the best prices an amazing user experience, a no-hassle return policy, and free shipping on orders over $50. If you're in-store, let them know you listen to the Powell Movement, and you'll get an additional 10% off. My next sponsor is Rescue Water, and each week I tell you how Rescue Water is proactive recovery. But what does that mean to you? Well, think of it like this. If you're really tired, you skip the coffee and grab an energy drink. Well, if you really need to hydrate like after you get off the hill, finish a workout, or get home from a big night, make the smart choice and drink a cold rescue water. It replaces electrolytes much better than your traditional sports drink. It's a difference I can feel every time. It works. Make it work for you by heading over to rescuewater.com, that's R-E-S-Q water.com, and save 20% on a 12 or 24 pack case with the code R-E-S-Q water T-P-M, that's all one word. Rescue Water is also available on Amazon. Those are my sponsors, so we'll jump right back into it. How does the progression of making money and snowboarding happen? Because I'm sure you're riding every day, meeting a shit ton of people. But for that to happen in your first couple months out in California is really crazy. It doesn't happen to people that often. And how does it progress for you? I mean, growing up on the East Coast and working at Eastern Border, I was getting hooked up through local reps there. And then when I got out to Mammoth, I had been getting some Santa Cruz boards from this guy, Mad Jagaman at the time, who now works for Burton. It's like amazing guy. And also Mission 6 and Monix was kind of new and kind of cool at that time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I moved out to Mammoth and then I was out there for maybe like a couple of months. And Susie Flores was the team manager of Mission 6 and Monix at the time. And I kind of had talked to her over email and phone a couple of times and then met her in Mammoth. And she just hit me up one day and I think she was with Tara Dakitas, which I was so nervous. I love Tara. I thought she was like so awesome. I think they called me and Susie was like, we're going to put you on the pro team. <laughs> I was like, what? I don't know what that means. And she's like, we're just going to give you this little bit of money. And I think it was like, you know, nothing. But to me at the time, it was crazy because I just didn't know that you could do that really. And So from there, kind of the next thing, I was like, what do I do now? Are you expected to compete as a pro now? What do they expect from you? I mean, that was a thing. Like, I didn't really know what I was supposed to do or what they expected. And when I had moved out to Mammoth, I knew I needed to make some money. So I had gotten a job at the chart house there. I was working there with, like, a couple girls. I think Kimmy Fasani was working there also. And the manager at the time was 
like a bit of an a-hole. And, and so I got like a little bit of money where I was like, you know, I'm not going to work there for at least like the next two months and figure out what I'm supposed to do now that I'm like getting paid a little bit. Like, I don't know. And so I kind of asked Susie, like, what should I do? And, and she was kind of like, well, we're going out to, I think it might've been a Grand Prix or something at Breckenridge. She's like, oh, we're going out here in two weeks or something. You should come. We can get you into the contest. And that was not my thing at all, like slope style courses or jumps or whatever. And so growing up on the East Coast, so many good snowboarders came out of those resorts on the East Coast, like pipe and park riders. But that just like wasn't me. Was it not you because you don't like competing? Was it the pressure? Because I'm sure the tricks and the features you're fine on. But when they say, Colleen Quigley, it's time to drop in in three, two, one. Is that when it fell apart? Oh, yeah, that I like hate that. That's crazy. I, I can't deal with that type of format or like contest or even just the idea that people are watching you. I don't like when you strap into a snowboard. Like, I've always just kind of wanted to snowboard for me and for fun. And, and the idea that not only are people watching you, but they're like writing down on a piece of paper and scoring you against everybody else. Like it's nerve wracking and kind of crazy. And but on top of that, just like sheer board control. Like the jumps at Breckenridge were probably like bigger than any jumps I had ever seen. And then you factor in the contest situation. But I remember like I was at the top and I think I missed practice or something. I was just so out of the loop with like what these contests were like and what you had to do and how serious you had to take it or some people took it. And I remember just showing up to the top of the course and it's like hadn't hit the jump, top of the jump. They call my name. (laughs) I think I like went to do just like a back three or something off the first jump and just like ate shit so hard. I was like, well, that was fun. Pretty much never did it again. I know you filmed, I think you were with Peep Show. So maybe that was how you were going to show your value to the sponsors. And really, you were like the rider's rider. You were the girl that everybody wanted to be around, I think, just because they liked you a lot. And you might not have been the best pro snowboarder up there, but you're, you know, middle of the pack pro snowboarder. And contests aren't your thing. You'll get a video part here or there. But it's really, I think, the personality and everything else that you brought just created a whole package that people wanted to be around. That's my thought. I don't know how you feel about it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely had my crew that are my super good friends to this day. But when I look back on my snowboarding, I think it maybe it's a symptom of just always feeling like that wasn't a reality for me. I never took it super seriously. I always had this kind of like lighthearted, like, yeah, whatever. Because in no weird way, maybe I felt like I kind of didn't belong there. Like I wasn't good enough or something. And so I always had this like attitude of kind of like half trying, not like fully trying, which was the wrong attitude to have. Like I should have given it my all and tried really hard. But I think for that reason, a lot of times I wasn't the super competitive person, like either at the contest or trying to get shots even like a lot of times we'd show up to spots and I'd kind of just be like joking around or doing whatever you know I mean there were times where it was more serious than that for sure but I was never the super focused going out and doing it and I look at some of the riders today that I work with at Takayan and previously worked with at Solomon and I'm like oh yeah I mean those are the people that are like future legends you know and it's not like it's an accident they're incredibly talented and they work so so hard. But you're the one that would loosen up the mood a little bit too, I would think, where the people that work so hard and sometimes they're really, really focused and you being lighthearted, maybe not taking it as serious, that brings something to the table. I think that people probably appreciate or you wouldn't have been invited on shoots. (laughs) Yeah, except for people go out and like some people have in their mind, like they want to hit this certain thing and they're trying to get this shot for their video part. And then I show up and I'm like, like making jokes and maybe not helping the machine run efficiently to like get shit done. Like that was not received well. (laughs) In your career, you had a shit ton of sponsors. I could go through the sponsor list. They're all impressive between Nikita, Air Blaster, Kind, Vans, Capital Union, Eastern Border, Waterville Valley, Ass Industries, Cobra Dogs, K2, 686. A lot of people showed you support over the years. And snowboarding was never going to be your breadwinner by any means. But in terms of like one year, the most money you ever made as a pro, how much did you make? Oh, like not much. I mean, I think five grand, 10 grand. More than that, like I was making enough where I could like essentially 
have roommates and pay for like my room and chip in on like house stuff and whatever and not have to ask my parents for help or anything like that. And they definitely helped me like a little bit that first year when I was in Mammoth. But I was making enough to live and then like had some travel budgets where I could go out and go on some trips and film. But it was never like really saving money or anything like that. When I bought a house a couple years ago and they actually like made me sign on the loan that I would like agree to not be a pro snowboarder for two years or something after I bought it because I don't know, I wasn't making enough money or whatever. I thought it was kind of funny. I would say another big part of your life was summer camp. I think you spent five years in Mount Hood, a full year of your life at summer camp. And is that really how you created a a shit ton of relationships throughout the industry? Because I look at summer camp as that's where everybody's coming through. And I feel like for any up and comer to get their foot in the door at a summer camp is a way to really help make your career happen. Yeah. And for me, like I remember one summer I was sitting at my parents' house in Massachusetts and it was so hot and I was sitting in the backyard and a handful of my friends had gotten jobs at High Cascade and they were out snowboarding. and That was all I wanted to do. I was like, man, how do I get there? But I had always heard that if you couldn't do the whole summer out there, you couldn't work there. You had to commit from like the pre-camp week through like breakdown after the last session. And because I was doing summer semesters at UVM, I just kind of like never bothered because I heard those were kind of the rules. And then I bumped into Preston Strout, like at a U.S. Open once we had dinner and he was like, why don't you work at camp? I told him that and he was like, oh, you should just apply and see if we can figure something out. And so I went out to work at camp and at that time I was really just unsure what I was doing. I'd been snowboarding for a couple of years and yeah, like getting paid like a little bit. And, you know, it was kind of hitting this point where I was like, oh, what am I doing? Like, I'm not really breaking through or not even sure that I wanted that, but do I want to get a job what would I even do I don't know so I was getting like a little burnt out and I don't even totally know why I mean maybe just not having a direct purpose or something and I went to camp and it was really refreshing those first couple years that I worked at camp it was some of the most fun summers of my life like those guys did an incredible job of creating this super fun and funny environment and then you got to snowboard every day and Mount Hood is beautiful and I love Oregon and it's cool to see like little kids get excited and it's also rad to see like the ones that they just like don't know what's going on or don't get it kind of like in the same way that I think I didn't get it until I honestly like started working at Eastern Border. Yeah. What was the most fucked up thing you saw a camper do? Like trick wise or just like messed up? Just messed up. Trick wise. No, we don't care about trick wise here. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, honestly, when I worked there, the vibe was like so kind of positive that you didn't really see like anybody being an asshole or doing anything weird for the most part I mean I saw like a lot of injuries I watched a girl like compound fracture her ankle like on a trampoline was that was fucked up yeah yeah that is that's not really what I was looking for I was thinking that someone like filled your toilet to the brim with poop and you had to figure out what to do but that didn't happen No, not stuff like that. And I was a coach, so I didn't sleep with the kids. Like, the counselors spent the nights with them. They probably saw, like, way weirder stuff. Like, essentially, I would just show up in the morning and meet the kids, and then we'd go up on hill, and we'd snowboard and coach them to, like, two or something, and then bail. After hours, after snowboarding, you kind of, like, catch them making out in the woods and stuff. They're kind of, like, the known spots that, like, campers would sneak off to at different times, and you would, like, bust them making out or copping a feel or something in the woods, which was always pretty funny. Well, we'll take that, I guess. (laughs) Another part of your career, which I think you did this for a while, but I'm not 100%, is magazine testing for snowboards. Did you do that a a bit? Yes, I did the Transworld board test for like two years, I think. Well, I'm going to look at you as the authority on the board test and ask you some questions about it. All right. These magazine tests, first and foremost, Transworld is no longer in business. And What are your thoughts on that? It's so crazy. It's such a bummer. And it's a real gut punch and reminder to go out and support the things that you care about. Buy magazines, buy stuff from your local skateboard and snowboard shop. I think like a lot of people took the magazines for granted and take the shops for granted. And I'm definitely like guilty of that. I hadn't bought like a trans world or a snowboarder in years. I do try to support those guys as much as I can in my job here at Dekine. Because honestly, like, 
those magazines and then the shops, I think like for me, it was Eastern border. Like those are the reasons why, like I got so psyched on snowboarding and it's kind of like scary for the next generation of us, you know, are they going to have that experience or care about snowboarding that much, you know? It's a sign of the times. I mean, while there's a lot of nostalgia in print, and I used to read magazines cover to cover as often as I could, it gets to the point where the guys over at the Snowboard Journal wanted to send me a subscription, and I asked them to send me the code for their portal where I could just read the magazine on my phone. Yeah. While I understand that it is a huge loss not having Transworld, I also feel like it's almost a sign of the times because I can't remember the last time I picked up a magazine to read and I get them free. For sure, print, like who's reading print magazines? I mean, I do sometimes, but it's like very specific ones. But the fact that they shut the whole thing down, I think is like, what's a little scary, like whatever, they don't make print anymore, but they're still like, there's an online portal or social media or websites. What's weird to me is that a big chunk of the authority in surf, snowboarding, skateboarding, whatever, who help develop the culture and put riders up on pedestals. And, you know, they're just like a big part of everything that happens. It's just weird that that voice, part of it's been shut down with the shutdown of Transworld. I brought up magazine tests because of what I feel like the magazine business should turn into. And when I look at magazines now, there's a place for them. And I feel like the high-end ones that are really hyper-focused into a certain niche are great. For the ski and snowboard mainstream publications, I feel like the value is having those for a buyer's guide and a photo annual. I feel like if you have those two issues, you satisfy the consumer's need to get product information and the consumer's need to have badass imagery that they can actually finger through and look at, whereas the other stuff is all web content two issues each year and they're high end and expensive and that's what a print magazine could be in the future with a great web portal and great social yeah i mean like i find like the interviews really interesting as well because you kind of get a glimpse into what the person's really like i don't feel that way at all i don't feel (laughs) like you get anything from a print interview well i feel like maybe just the medium has changed like what you're doing you know it's The way people are digesting things are just different. Now, people are reading less, which is kind of scary. It's an on-demand world. Totally. I won't go too deep into the magazine testing, but when you're testing with magazines, I think you're getting free boards from brands or getting paid by brands as well. Does that ever influence the testing? I mean, I'm sure you're not getting all boards with white top sheets, so you know what you're writing. How do you take personal bias out of the test? I honestly never really cared, you know, like, and I can't remember if there were graphics on the boards. There must have been because it's so hard to make boards like without graphics on the timeline that they would need them for those tests. But for sure, there are those biases of like maybe the companies that you like think you don't like or whatever. But I think then it's interesting when you ride a board and you're like, oh, wow, like that was actually pretty fun. And those tests were kind of grueling. I remember you'd be riding like all day from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., which I almost never do. And then you're switching out a board every single run. And I remember when I went to them, I think they were both in Colorado two years in a row. And those were really different snow conditions, a little icy, super cold. So really hard on one run to even gauge like how you really felt about the board. And I think like at a certain point, you're just testing so many boards, you're not even really thinking about what brand it is. You're just like, oh, that was a fun run. And I like the way that board rode. And in the end, I feel like as a snowboarder, it's like all I really care about is that like, the board feels good under my feet and then I'm going to have like a fun day. Yeah. And I think one thing the consumer has to think about too, is you're taking one run on a countless number of boards and Mm -hmm. on a powder board, you might be riding a bulletproof day. Yeah. You still have to review that board. So it's not going to be accurate. The blackboard test is pretty cool that like stab does. Like I was watching the one with Jordy, like a little bit of it the other day and like Dane did it obviously, but like, they surf the board like a lot more and kind of give more like critical feedback. You know, I remember like for us, it was just kind of like filling the bubbles on how was the flex? How was whatever, you know, like I was watching Jordy's the other day and he was surfing it for who knows how long, but like tons of shots on different waves. And he was like, this board sucked for this reason, you know? Yeah. I know you did some marketing work at an agency when you were living the snowboard life, but I feel like there is almost a hard stop to your snowboard career. Because at one point, 
in your life when people ask you what you do, you would probably say, I'm a snowboarder because you're getting paid to snowboard, or you lie because you don't want to talk about it. And then you transition into desk life. And it sounds like you, like every single other person in the world, when you go for your first desk job, you actually apply like a regular application type deal. Oh, totally. And so many people over the years have been like, yeah, your transition from snowboarding to desk jockey or getting a job or whatever was so easy. And it's so funny to hear that because when I think of that change in that time in my life, it was so hard. It was so challenging. You can really get down on yourself when you're like, not sure what to do. And you're trying to do something that's totally different. You don't maybe feel like you have the skills to do it or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I seriously owe so much to Pat Bridges. I think he's always been so rad to me and like available when I needed like advice or whatever or help. And during that time, I think I was talking to him a little bit about just like not being sure what to do and next phase. And I was always really interested in writing. Like when I was a little kid, I wrote like all these crazy short stories and would bind them in a book and like illustrate them and stuff. Art wasn't really my strong suit, so the illustrations are pretty bad, but it was kind of just like a lifelong thing I was interested in and liked doing. And so Pat had me write like, a couple stories when I was on the trip. The last one that I did was uh, this trip to North Carolina with the Peep Show girls and I was writing the story. And on that trip, I tore my knee. It was a pretty rough trip for like a number of reasons. The vibe was like kind of shitty, but I tore my knee, Marie Huckle crashed her car. We got in a lot of trouble hitting this spot. I had torn my knee at this point already. And basically the rail divided like public property and private property. And myself and Desiree and I think Marie were standing on the private property side of the rail. And then like Gabby Viteri, Huggy. Yeah, they were standing on like the other side of the filmer. And essentially like the ones that were on the private property side, we all got charged with criminal trespassing. And so it was like a shit show of a trip. And that's kind of when I was like, you know, like, I don't know if I'm like really having that much fun anymore. And then when I talked to my surgeon about my knee, he was just kind of like, well, how much stuff do you want to do later in life? Like you want to like surf and be able to snowboard when you're 50, you know? And I was like, yeah, definitely. And maybe that was a bit dramatic at the time, but he was kind of like, maybe rethink what you're doing, I guess. And I just had a torn meniscus. I could have been totally fine. And I am fine. I still snowboard and do all that stuff right now. But I think at that time, I was already in a place where I was kind of like, eh, what am I doing? And so that was enough for me to be like, all right, I don't want to be a 40 year old marketing coordinator. And I always kind of felt like I should be doing something else. I didn't belong necessarily like in the pro snowboard crowd or whatever as a writer, you know, like I just wasn't good enough. That was kind of like always what I felt. And so I just started looking around and talking to people. And that last summer that I went to go work up at camp, Brooke Geary had asked me to write some stuff for Yobi, do a column. I was doing a column for Onboard also in the UK. So I just kind of like went up there, like, oh, I didn't really want to work at camp for another summer, but I was like, I'm just going to go up there. There's tons of people to interview and write content on. So I just did that for the summer with the goal at the end of the summer to find a job. And then I think that following October, November is when like I had applied for a job at Solomon and Bonfire. And I remember Brad Seward called me on the phone and I was all nervous, you know, I had one conversation with him and he was just laughing and he's like, what's up, Colleen? Do you remember meeting me when you were like 14? And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) He was like, all right, sick, come work for us. Yeah, he's just like such a nice guy. I got such a good vibe from him. And that was it. I took the job. Now I'm going to take a final sponsor break, and Spy Optic is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Yes, 25 years Spy has been crushing it with innovation and style. Based out of Southern California, Spy is a collective of athletes, artists, and product designers who live and breathe action sports. To celebrate this 25th anniversary, Spy is re-releasing some iconic shades. Jeremy McGrath's MC3, Dale Jr.'s Dirty Mo, and the Timeless Scoop 2. They are badass and they are back. To get 20% off your spy purchase, head on over to spyoptic.com, place your order, and then at checkout, enter the code TPM20, that's all one word, and note that this discount does not apply for the game-changing Ace EC goggle. To find out more about the products and the brand, head on over to spyoptic.com. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. 
They have been brewing the Northwest's best beer since 2006, and they encourage everyone to go drink some of their beer outside. Why? Because 10 Barrel is all about the outside. They live and breathe the snow and bike lifestyle, and they support it with events, sponsored athletes, movie projects, and more. Next time you're at the store, pick up some 10 Barrel. And to find out more about the beer that supports action sports, the events, and their pubs, head on over to 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors, and now we'll get back into the podcast. So you get hired for PR and community marketing for Solomon and Bonfire. Yeah. PR, I would think you're writing press releases, you're working with the brands, you're figuring out all the products and pitching them to different publications. What is the community marketing side of it? So essentially, I was lowest person on the totem pole, like I was expected and working with such an amazing group of humans, talented people in their different areas. Brad was still running everything day to day, such a legend. And Amy Eichner, who I love and respect so much, and I work with that to kind now, was doing marketing there. And Kevin Stevenson, super cool. And Hava was doing all the team stuff. And at the time, I think Solomon was doing some of the coolest stuff in snowboarding. So I just went there, like really just wanted to learn from everyone and observe. And I did a lot of writing. So I started writing all the catalog, copy, yeah, like press releases, around trade shows and stuff, I was kind of the one that would talk to people and talk to media and pitch products and whatever from the community standpoint, doing all the social and helping to figure out at the time, Solomon was creating a lot of content around the team and they still do. But that first year I came on and they're in the middle of team vacation, which was like so awesome and so fun. And essentially like every time they dropped a video, it was writing copy for it, releasing it, getting it out to the media, making sure that all the work that Hava and the team and the other marketing people were doing was just kind of getting amplified and out there. And is it tough working with a Solomon? Because I worked at K2, so it's kind of a similar situation. You being on the snowboard side and at Solomon, do you have to fight to get respect for the Solomon snowboard brand based on everybody looks at you as a ski brand? A lot of that work was in progress and ongoing when I started there. But for sure, I know that that was like an uphill battle that the snowboard brand had to climb. But I think ultimately that I could be wrong, but I think if you're a brand and you want to go into the snowboard market or you're already there, but you want to just be, I don't know, cooler or whatever, like you just need to support the riders and the community. And Solomon did a lot of that. They paid a lot of riders, not just enough money to scrape by and be snowboarders, but to live and do it as a profession. They created like tons of cool content for everyone and supported shops. And I think they did a lot of giving to the snowboard community, which is cool. People respected them for it. If you look at it from an outside view, I know you were tied to it. But I mean, to the core 18 year old snowboarder who's going to look at a Solomon or you can buy a Capita, I would think there's a huge shift in I'm going with a ski brand, I'm going with a real snowboard brand. Yeah, that's so tricky, right? Like if you're in the know enough to know who the people are that run these companies, you're like, oh, Capital Blue, Montgomery, so sick. Like, of course you want to support Blue and his whole background is awesome and what he's done at Capital is so amazing. But then at the same time, it's kind of like, oh, all these rad people are working at Solomon. And on one hand, you could be like, oh yeah, Solomon's a ski company. But on the other hand, you could be like, well, they make really good product to have this amazing team arguably the best snowboard team. They're doing so much cool shit that you just kind of want to be a part of. And so I think kids that go into stores and a lot of that is team driven, you know, I think Jed and Chris and those guys like with their pro model, the Salamander was super fun. And I know kids were walking into stores asking for it, you know, and it's hard to do that. But I think maybe it's just about creating something that other people want to be a part of, I guess. What's the decision to leave Solomon? I was there for three years, almost exactly. And it was so hard to leave. It was so hard. So I love Solomon. Still, to this day, like they're the only board boots and bindings I will use. I just like love their products. And I love everybody that works there still. And I think they do a lot of really cool stuff. But out of the blue, DeKine was hiring this job here. And the VP of marketing at the time reached out to me. And I was kind of originally like, no, I don't want that job because I was really happy at Solomon. I had absolutely no reason to even think about leaving. But I remember Brad Stewart had told me, like, you never turned down an interview. So I was like, all right. So I did the interview with the kind. 
And I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I did a second interview and then they offered me the job. And ultimately, I think that Solomon was in a really good place as a brand. And I wanted to come to Dekine because I love this brand. And like I said before, I used the products from such a young age. And I think when I heard the story about how the brand started and then how it got into snowboarding, I was like, man, there's something real here and it's cool and there's something to love. And I want to be a part of doing marketing here. And I think historically, Dekine had not invested in marketing really at all. So there was a lot of potential. That was kind of the opportunity that I saw. And I think also it was scary. You know, I was super comfortable at Solomon. It was like, I knew exactly how to do my job. It was comfortable. It was fun. And then this kind of like scary, unknown opportunity came up where I was kind of like, oh, I'm going to learn a lot if I do this. I'm sure it's going to be really hard. And I kind of just felt like I had to take it. It was really out of the blue. I was like, all right, I'm just going to do it. Well, I would think when you start with Solomon, you probably don't know shit. You get in the office and then that's yeah. when your learning process starts. But you have to have a little bit of confidence when you're going to decline and realize I spent three years learning how to do all this stuff that I really didn't know how to do beforehand. So you can take another job that is scary. And when I look at Takine, it's it's such an interesting brand because most of the lifestyle brands in our sports that we see are sunglasses or hard goods. I feel like those are the brands that do a great job of it. Some clothing do as well. But no one really thinks of a pack and bag brand as the brand that's defining the lifestyle that people do. But the kind has been able to take bags and packs and really leave a mark on all their consumers. People bleed for Dekine. Yeah, and Dekine's been so product-driven for so long. It was always about making not necessarily the best product out there, like you could get more technical products elsewhere, but making like a really durable, good performing product that you can kind of rely on, like when you go in the backcountry or you go surfing or whatever, at a reasonable price, you know, kind of much more for like, I don't want to say like average person, but not for like the crazy extreme climber or runner or backpacker or whatever, more just kind of like, yeah, man, like we're just like snowboarders and surfers and like need for the backpack to be safe when you go in the backcountry, but not extreme or like unattainable or expensive or whatever. Your title is the director of digital marketing, I believe, at the kind. What do you actually do on a day to day? <laughs> yeah, this is a funny question to answer for sure, because, yeah, my title is director of digital. That was what I was hired for four years ago. I did that for about a year and a half. Well, we were launching a new website and getting email marketing replatformed and really figuring out what we were doing on social and how we were doing it. Because Dekine is a complicated business in terms of we sell a lot of non-sport backpacks and things like that and some apparel, but then also really sport driven at the heart of everything we do. So like how we organize our business appropriately for what we're trying to tell the world about Dekine. A lot of that groundwork hadn't been done and we we're doing that. And to be honest, we're still doing a lot of that. About two years ago, the person who was doing the snow marketing at the time, he left. We were going through a lot of transition period with the current owner and personnel and the organization here. And it kind of just snowballed from my boss at the time was like, you know, oh, shit, it's July. We haven't planned the season for snow. We don't have any of our ads done. And I used to do a lot of this stuff when I worked at Solomon, like snow was my bread and butter. and so. He was kind of like, oh, can you just jump in and help get things going so that we don't have like a complete ball drop there? And so I was like, yeah, for sure. So I dropped some of the stuff on the digital side and jumped in on snow. Fast forward to November. It's like a week before the sales meeting. And he's like, do you mind presenting at the sales meeting? <laughs> I'm like, what am I supposed to say? Because there's no plan. And so it was like, make a plan. And then I'd say like the first year there. I wasn't really owning it, you know, because it was kind of like I was still doing some of the digital stuff. I was doing most of the snow stuff, the things that had to happen. Yeah. And then eventually that just snowballed into if I'm going to do this and people's perception is that I'm doing this job, I'm going to own it. Yeah. I just kind of like dove in and did the snow stuff head on. So you manage all the stuff on snow. Is it ski and snowboard or just snowboard? It's ski and snowboard. So that was a huge learning curve for me and super cool experience. The Dekine ski team is so rad. It's pretty stacked. 
Yeah, it's really sick. And everybody is so talented and super cool. And I think Dakayan is really cool because it's kind of accepted in both worlds and cool, you know, in both areas. I can't really think of another brand that a pro snowboarder wants to use it and also a pro skier does too. Sunglasses and goggles. But other than that, you can't really. Yeah, totally. You're at the director level. And when you're at the director level, you've got to let go of some details. Does that happen where now you're at a higher level where you used to be on like the micromanaging of all the details of a project, but now you have to put your trust in other people to do it? Or is it such a small team that you're still involved in the details? No, it is such a crazy small team. Every day you're just in the weeds. After this, I'm probably going to get off the phone and go downstairs and pack some boxes to team riders. Okay. And I also need to think about how we go to market for the snow category for September through December, January of next year. Dakine's organization is like pretty flat. So on the marketing side, like Surf, for example, it's literally one guy. Like you follow Dakine Surf. He's posting on social media. He's dealing with all the athletes. He's defining the positioning and the plan for the whole surf category. Dakine must take over his whole life. Oh, totally. Yeah. We're all constantly in it. But I think that's kind of like the beauty of, it's like cliche, but doing what you love and loving what you do. It's kind of like, you don't mind working on the weekends or getting a call from a team rider on a Friday night because it's like fun. That's kind of what you want to be doing. That's how I feel personally. So I'm going to shift into a different direction really quick. And in your position now, you go from a world where you're a tall woman in a world of short men in the pro riding world. But as time (laughs) went on in riding life, More and more women were being sponsored. Things were getting better little by little. But when you get behind the curtain, I would think things are worse. How many women do you actually work with? Surprisingly, a good amount at Dakine. I was really amazed, actually, when I got here. When I first started, I think there were maybe like seven VPs here. And I think almost half were women. Wow. And then when you get down to like kind of the next level below that, there's so many strong, talented women here. And Dakine seems really about that, which is super cool. When you go to the trade shows and you kind of like walk around, you're like, man, there's not a lot of girls. And that sucks. I think like where I'm at now is that I'd like to do what I can in the position that I'm in for now, at least to try to help those girls that essentially were in the same position that I was in when I was working at camp. I was like, I don't know what to do, like how to get there, who even to talk to, just try to help those girls. And I don't exactly know how, but yeah, we need more ladies for sure. Yeah. I mean, do you look at it as something that you want to help facilitate the path for more women to make their way up to your level in the industry? Or do you look at it as something where you're focused on your own career? And while there is a bigger issue that you need to think about, I mean, you can only think about so much. I think like in the last year really I've kind of had this realization when I was younger when I was riding there were all these amazing women that were running marketing in the snowboard industry at Burton and Mervyn and Susie at Mission 6 and Monix there were actually like a good amount when I look around now there's really very few women doing at least marketing but in general at the snowboard brands and so I kind of started thinking how can I help what can I do I don't know I mean, all I really know is my experience and my perspective. And I told you kind of like what my story was. And so last summer, we just organized this little evening at camp at High Cascade and Wendell's. And it was super short, but because there are so many amazing women that work at Dakine, I brought one from every department at Dakine. So someone from like merchandising, product, finance, myself on marketing. We went up there with like eight or 10 girls from Dakine and we essentially just like had this little like Q&A meet and greet. It was meant for the girls that worked at camp, working there like I was, not sure what to do next. But actually a lot of campers came. I think like almost every girl that was on campus came and I just wanted them to know that, for example, Amy Eichner works here and she's a product line manager for outerwear and mitts and gloves. And Amy was a pro snowboarder, has like X Games medal, Mount Baker duct tape. She didn't go to school for product line management and she worked at Wendell's like back in the day. And I just like wanted these girls to know that it's attainable, you know, because of where they already are. They're experts in product. They know how to do this. We were there once and don't feel like you can't get there because you can and meet these 
women and get their phone numbers and email addresses. And if you have questions or if they can help you in any way, like reach out. Yeah, it was just like one night and people were psyched on it. But I just see like a lot of girls who are smart and talented, kind of like leaving the industry or not even entering it. Like they snowboard and maybe they work a camp or maybe they don't or whatever. And then they like go and do something else. Well, I would think this is the most intimidating industry that you can go into if you're a young woman who wants to start a career. It's just a bunch of dudes and it doesn't seem like there is any opportunity. And it's pretty awesome that you did that for the girls at camp. And I think showing, hey, this is how the path works. Because I think that's part of the problem is even the dudes don't know how to make it happen, but they're just hanging around and hanging around. And maybe some of the girls leave because they just see all the dudes hanging around and nothing happening. And eventually they go find a different career path. But with you educating people on how you guys made it work for you, I think that's how you're going to make a good change for the future. So much of it is luck, too. I personally feel so lucky for so many things that have happened to me. I think the more information people have, like the more they understand, like, oh, that's what product line management is. Like, oh, that's a job that every company that produces goods has. Like, oh, okay, like maybe I can do that. And yeah, just want to see more girls around doing stuff and snowboarding. And if I can help them some way, I'll do it. Would you make more money at the kind if you were a male? I don't think so, honestly. That's like, I think, a question that no matter what industry you work in, if you're a woman, it probably crosses your mind at some point. Like, hey, am I getting a fair shake here? You know, it's just, it's so weird being a girl on so many levels, especially in business. But I think at Dekine, I really don't think so. I feel such a mutual, even playing field respect here that has nothing to do with gender. Everybody's like surfers and snowboarders and there's no bro culture here. It's really inclusive, I think. Well, that is awesome. Now I'm going to go into inappropriate questions. And I didn't really get to speak with Leanne Pelosi, who is a snowboard legend. And she had come up with three questions. She came up with more than three. And I'm going to give you all of her questions. But she emailed them to me. So I'm going to put on my best Leanne Pelosi voice. And I'm going to ask you some inappropriate questions. All right, let's do it. They're not even that inappropriate. One, why didn't you go on a honeymoon? Oh, we did go on a honeymoon. We went to Bali. We waited for a bit because after we got married in August, Ami's mom, Ami is Finnish, and his mom came over from Finland. And so she was here for six weeks after our wedding. So we waited till November. How is it having the mother-in-law with you guys for six weeks after your wedding? Because you're newlyweds, you should be stoked, and then you got your mother-in-law around all the time. It was pretty cool. The crazy thing is she's Finnish and speaks like almost no English. Well, that's good for you. Yeah, except for, you know, when somebody's like in your house and they're visiting and you feel like you should be entertaining them. And like, if you're the guest, you feel like weirdly, like you should be entertaining the host and you don't really relax. Like it can be really fun. Like when people are at your house, it's also tiring. And then you layer on like a huge language barrier. You're constantly wondering, is that person comfortable or tired? Or do they want something or whatever? But getting to just be around her for six weeks, all of a sudden, I just started to get like a way better sense for her personality. And it was cool, but exhausting. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Now we'll go with question number two. What is your least favorite thing about your husband, Ami? Can I have two? Yeah, yeah, you can. (laughs) Is that weird to say after only six months of marriage? No, Ami is one of the greatest humans I have ever had the pleasure of knowing in my life. I'm glad that I got to marry him. But he's really, really slow. Like he's like the slowest human. He's just like pretty chill. He loves like racing and doing the bank slaloms and whatever. But until he's literally at the start shack dropping in, he is perpetually late. I'm always waiting for him. He's an artist. Yeah, exactly. Time does not exist in his universe. And I'm a very punctual person. I feel tremendous guilt if I'm late, like I'm making that person wait. And then he's also pretty messy. And when I say like messy, he's not dirty. When he decides he's going to clean something, he like really cleans it. But I don't know, like our kitchen table, he's always just dropping stuff on it, which is fine. But I like am the type of person that wants to see the table just completely clean. You don't like crumbs. Yeah, I don't like crumbs. And it's not just crumbs. It's books or pens or whatever. I'm kind of like a clean visual space, clear mind type person. Now we'll go to her only not controversial, but her only really inappropriate one. 
Do the kind women receive the same pay as the kind male athletes? Yeah, I think so. You would know. Yes, I would know. And I think yes, but I would say that the kind, depending on the sport, has supported women at different levels. I think in snowboarding and skiing, we've always been pretty solid and we haven't just had like the one token girl on the team there's always been like multiple girls on the team I think right now we don't have a super senior girl on the team you know and so I think that that varies you know like depending on where somebody is in their career obviously to say that would we pay women less like definitely not I mean I'm the one that decides that from obviously like a budget that's given to me by somebody else. I think that it has absolutely nothing to do with gender. And in fact, basically what I do is I'm like, oh, cool, like team rider on the team. What do you want to do this season? What are your goals? And tell me how Dekine can support you in getting there. But yeah, I think Dekine in short has been historically pretty equal on that front. I think we were lacking a little bit on the surf side for sure, historically, but we definitely are pushing our accessories team again. And we have like a lot of really badass women surfers on the team now and on the snow side as well, for sure. So those are her three inappropriate questions, but I'm going to give you some of her random ones too. She wanted me to ask about your topless backflip, the one you didn't peep show, but I don't really need to do that. I just wanted to bring it up so everybody knows that you did a topless backflip and they can imagine how uninhibited you were back in the day. I figured that would come up at some point because it always does. That was a classic example of just goofing around and like we had like a bad day. We're up in Grizzly Gulch and I was like, I'm going to lighten the mood right now and just do something funny. And it's so funny how uncomfortable people are with like a little nudity or a little joke. I actually wasn't topless. I had these like nippy things on. (laughs) I don't think it makes people that uncomfortable, but maybe it does. The next random question that she had was, Your husband, and I'll ad-lib a little bit, you and your husband are both badasses on your snowboards. I will call out that you were faster than him at the bank slalom, I think, this year by a few tenths of a second. So he should think about that next year. But when are both of you going to combine the best of your riding and produce a super snowboarding baby? (laughs) Is that from Leanne? Yes. Oh, my God. I don't know. They say trying is the funnest part. (laughs) That's what I've heard. I mean, we're married now, so we got that going for us. I don't know. Yeah, that's such like a funny question because I've heard people say that it's never the right time for a kid. And I can't honestly imagine planning that because, yeah, that seems like a massive inconvenience for just all the fun stuff that Ami and I want to do and the lives that we live. Trust me, it's way better if you don't plan it. (laughs) Yeah, that's what everybody says. We both love kids and, you know, that'll happen at some point. But so you don't have a date for us. No date. But I would propose the same question back to Leanne. Okay. Well, if I interview her again, I will ask her that one. I will jump into her final bonus question. When are you going to get away from your desk and go snowboarding with her? Oh, my God. I hope soon. Yeah, it's it's just funny when you go to work for a company and you just have different responsibilities. And a lot of that is kind of like the bullshit perception of just being seen at your desk from nine to five, which I personally like do not subscribe to that at all. But I also understand why it's important. It was difficult when I decided to take a job because then I didn't get to hang out with Leanne and Hannah and Robin and Jackie and all these girls that were still snowboarding at the time, really good friends of mine. I just instantaneously saw them a lot less. The girls are like, we're going to Baja next Tuesday for two months, you should come. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I can't because we have our sales meeting and whatever. That is a bummer. But I need to be better at just cutting loose and sometimes forgetting about the little shit or the stuff that needs to get done. It'll get done. I should just cut loose and head up to Canada and hang out with those girls for sure. But different lives. I'm grateful that I work in snowboarding and still get to like do a lot of stuff with them and center kind of my life around trying to help them and Yeah, I'm not like working in some random industry where I only get to think about it on the weekends, you know? Yeah, well, I look at your career as taking the path of a desk job in snowboarding 
ensures that you're going to be part of this industry for as long as you choose to stay in it. You can stay at the kind forever or bounce to a couple other jobs within the industry, but you'll still be in snowboarding. And for some people on the pro level, they don't get to make that decision because sometimes their career ends and they just have to figure it out because when the snowboard career ends for a lot of people, it's not like they have millions saved up and they're able to just go live off the fat of their snowboarding career. So you at least have longevity in this industry by choosing the desk route. And it didn't seem like the pro route was going to pan out to be huge for you anyway. But I want to thank you for your time. You're the first business episode I've had with a female guest and that's sad, crazy or whatever. You won't be the last by any means. But I look at you as working in a world of men and selling to a market that's not all men. And you seem to be doing it the right way. And it's cool to see the path that you took and how gender really didn't impact it. You were a tomboy growing up and you didn't have to deal with any bullshit that that seems like a lot of the women I've had on the show before have had to deal with. It doesn't seem like genders impacted your life that much. Maybe it did. Maybe I just like didn't let it, you know, I don't know. Thank you, Mike. That was awesome. Thank you. Hopefully it was cool. I don't know. So that was time with Colleen Quigley and her story is a cool one. She's like the super fun person who happens to be an athlete with a lot of talent. And while that talent took her a lot of places, maybe she believed that she had more talent to offer behind the scenes. One takeaway here, and I don't know if this is good or bad, is that until recently, with the things that Colleen is doing to benefit young women, she didn't let gender get in the way of her life and career. It was like she ignored it and so did everyone else as Colleen has a personality that has always made her fit in with the guys and girls alike. And while Colleen might not have set out to make a difference in the lives of women in action sports, she is one of the few women who has a position of power to make a change. It'll be interesting to see what she does as she continues to level up in the action sports organizational chart. That's the show for this week. Now I want to thank you for listening and ask you to support my great sponsors who make the show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, Spy Optic, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Stanley. Have a great week, everyone.